I'm Chad, as you hopefully know, because you've watched these before. Amy's moderating, uh, along with, I think, Haley's on the mod as well in the other office. So uh, they're going to answer questions that can be just typed real quick if they know the answer. Otherwise, they'll let me know the questions and I'll answer them. So if you have any questions at all pertaining to pen making. All right, so thanks for joining me. What we're going to do today and what we're going to do over the next couple weeks is kind of, not kind of, but we're going to go through kitless or bespoke pen making. Now, it's often called kitless, although some custom pen makers don't like the term kitless. And some people don't think bespoke is right because that means it's made for an individual. But whatever you want to call it, kitless, bespoke, custom, it's this style that we're going to cover. And we're going to go over today tooling what you need, what you can get like optional, and some of the alternatives. So if you don't have everything I show you, don't panic. Uh, a lot of this is, is kind of finding a way with what you have sometimes, and then you can always work into it. I will tell you with custom pen making, and I'm just gonna go with custom from now on. With custom pen making, a lot of the cost is upfront. So all the tooling is, is, if you do it all at once, it adds up really quickly. But once you've done it, you're kind of done unless you change sizes. So once you have all the tooling, it's not bad because then you just really are buying blanks and nibs and things. That's good. Um, and I may need help with names, but I think I got them all. So that's what we're, that's the goal here. And today the goal is to kind of introduce you to the different tooling, because if you've made pens and you've used kits, uh, it's kind of more of a streamlined process. The kit makes it really nice and smooth to make them. You've got bushings and all that kind of stuff. Whereas custom pens, you have a little more uh, responsibility for how your shape is and your, you know, your length and all that different stuff. It's all up to you. So there's no rules with this. And that's important to understand that there's no rules. Uh, so all that being said, if you have a question, type it in. We'll get it in here. And we're going to go over this. Now, one thing I want to tell you right up front is you can do this on a wood lathe or a metal lathe. And probably whichever one you do first will be easiest for you in the long run. For example, I started doing this on a metal lathe first. And it's, I wouldn't say it's hard for me, but it's more difficult for me on the wood lathe just because I'm so used to the ins and outs of the metal lathe for this process that it's kind of fun to do the wood lathe because it's more of a challenge. But that being said, many of the great custom makers out there right now still use wood lathes exclusively and there's nothing wrong with that because it works just fine but if you have a metal lathe you can do it if you have a wood lathe you can do it so it really really makes it cool all right let's get into this what is a custom pen so if you're if you're very new to it and you've made pens you've you've seen pens that look like this where You've got the, the pen parts and you make the body and you assemble. Nothing wrong with that. I'll never stop making pen kits uh, because they're, they're great, they're fun and easy and it's nice. But a custom pen is really kind of more individual. Uh, it's more individualistic for the person making it because they can make what they want. If they like a fat pen, a skinny pen, a short pen, a long pen, whatever, uh, they can make it with a clip or they can make it with no clip. So you kind of get to choose, pick and choose what you make. Uh, you can maybe see that this one is satin and I'll zoom in here in just a minute. This one's more of a satin finish where this is more of a shiny finish. So you can kind of tailor it really nicely. And I'm gonna show you three, four different makers here. Uh, we've got, this is uh, Alchemist Woodworks and this is one of Amy's favorites. It's a fountain pen. It's got a big copper clip on it, like a hammered copper. Uh, that's pretty cool. We'll put that one there. This is a Braxton at Divine. Oh, there's no nib in this one. But you can see it's a nice, nice little sleek design. Uh, this is one of mine here using a Stormwinds blank set. Kind of a smaller, slimmer pen, but not short. Uh, this is a Jim Hines made of ebonite. And what the reason I'm showing you guys these is you can kind of see they're all, they're all pens. They're all, you know, about this long and about this thick. But... There's a lot of different shapes and sizes and you can kind of look at certain ones over time and say, okay, that's a so-and-so because you'll start to pick up on how they make certain things. This is a guy named Zach at uh, Resin Works. Yes, I didn't say NB Woodworks, Resin Works. 
uh, but this is uh, his abalone shell. And the reason I have these up here is because they're all, there's five different people made these and they're all kind of unique in their own way. So let me zoom in on those. And there's a little close up. So that's Zach's abalone shell. And I don't know what number this was, but this was when he first started making uh, custom pens. And we should ask him because he came down and we made a couple on the metal lathe, but he started on the wood lathe. And I'd be curious to know if he thinks one is easier or more difficult than the other. That's the Jim Hines. And I apologize. I know Jim has a name for this model, but I don't remember what it is. That's your Braxton Frankenberry from Divine. That's your Alchemist Woodworks. And there's mine right there, no clip. So that just shows you the options and some of the little details that will make them individualistic. Once you're set up and once you're comfortable making them, the cool thing is all you need is a blank and a nib if you're using a fountain pen or some ink if you're doing a rollerball. So uh, you can do really endless things with these. It's really fun. This is the one we're going to make over the next couple weeks. It's a copper and silver blank. So that's going to look cool. Let's talk about what goes into a custom pen. What you're actually making. So you're you're generally going to be making three parts. Now, let me tell you, all of this will vary as time goes on on how detailed you get. So if you want to add trim rings and a clip or a finial uh, embellishment or anything like that, you're going to add more parts and that's fine. The whole goal for the next few weeks is to basically give you the simplistic version so you can make the three parts and have a functional pen. And then you can progress and say, okay, I don't want one drill bit in my cap. I want to step it down to make it more slimmer at the end and then I can taper it, things like that. So the whole goal is just to get you all the basics you need to make these and then you can take it from there and tweak it into the, the finer piece that you want. So we're going to be making essentially three pieces, the cap, the body, and the section. A section is what holds the nib that holds your ink that screws into your body. So with each part, you have a couple of things. In a cap, you have your, your hole through and your cap threads on the inside. Then matching, you have your body with the cap threads on the outside. Inside of that, you have your section threads, which in our case is going to be an M10 inside. On your section, you've got your grip here and then your section threads that go into the body. And then you've got the dreaded threads inside for your fountain pen nib. Now nibs generally come with the nib, the feed, and the body. No, the housing. The nib, the feed, and the housing. And the housing threads are very fine and very specific. So you're going to want to know which kind of nib you want to use to start out with because you're going to need a tap for those. And that's, that's the main parts of this pen. So you've essentially got a cap and a body thread, a body and a body thread, and a section thread inside. The section, although it's the smallest, is probably the most difficult. You're going to use more tools and more drill bits for this than any other part, which is kind of crazy if you think about it, because it's just so small and cute. So those are our parts. Any questions on that? Good to go? All right. Now, <clears throat> let's talk tooling. And we're going to spend a little time on this and go through each one a little bit. And it's going to just be to help you better understand what you have and what you need or what you can use until you get the stuff you want if you don't already have it. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of walk through it step by step in sections to kind of give you an idea. All right, let's talk about tools you may already have. Uh, first, of course, is going to be a live center. Most of us have different live centers um, for other turning, so we can use those. They're going to fit our lathe with our Morse taper. It doesn't have to be an extended tip like this. It could be a normal cone uh, live center. If you have an extended tip like this, it's nice because you can 
get a little closer when you're turning versus having the 45 all the way to the tip. But it doesn't matter. Don't buy another one just because you don't have this type. Any live center will work. Uh, then you're going to need a drill chuck. Uh, same thing with a drill chuck. If you have any sort of drill chuck that works, don't go out and get a different one. This happens to be a keyless. And some days I like the keyless, some days I hate the keyless. So I can't, I can't tell you if I would get a keyless specifically, but it works fine. Um, to use a keyless, you basically just have two grip points that twist. Main thing you want is your chuck needs to accept a half inch uh, shaft or drill bit because some of the tooling may have that half inch on it. So a drill chuck is important and the half inch is the most important part. Most of us have a drill chuck already, so that's kind of good. Uh, next is drill bits. And speaking of things that we all have mostly, uh, we're going to need a couple of things with the drill bit. We're going to need, if we have, if you don't have a center drill, you're going to want to get a center drill. Uh, this is a number three, I think. Yeah, number three. Uh, we have these in sets from zero to seven, and we also have individuals. You really only need one mid-size like this, a three or so, three or four. But a center drill is very important for this because you really want to get your holes started off in the right spot. And a center drill will get you lined up. Once you've used a center drill a little bit in custom pen making, you'll probably use it more in your other pen making because you know where your hole is going to start and you're going to like that. So center drill is an easy thing to pick up. If you don't have one, you're going to want one and they're really inexpensive. So not a big deal there. Then you're going to need drill bits. Now this is one thing where you can get, you know, like cheap drill bits, normal drill bits, and that'll, it'll work fine for a while. But if you're going to do much of this, you're going to want to invest in good quality bits. These are short little like jobber style bits that I use for um, my drill turret on our metal lathe. And I use them out here for customs as well. But just for the section, here, I'm going to lay these parts out as we talk about them. We're going to use Zach's pen so he gets to be the model. So just for this section, you're going to need four different drill bits. And actually five if you count the drill bit with the tenon cutter, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And that one comes with the tenon cutter, so you don't have to worry about that. But just for the drilling of this nib, the hole into the section right here, you need four different drill bits. And the reason being is everywhere you see on the nib where it changes size, you change the drill bit for that depth. And by doing that, when you screw this in, it's nice and firm. It doesn't wobble or move around in the hole. It kind of just fits like a glove in there. So the section uses four different drill bits. There's our center drill. Now, for the body, the inside of the body, you're going to need a drill bit. And we're going to go over sizes once we're making, so don't worry about that. And then for inside the cap, you're going to need one. Now, going back to what I mentioned before, for, for this demonstration in this series, we're going to drill one hole into our cap, and then we're going to do our tapping uh, inside. Whereas down the road, you might drill two or even three different drill bits depth-wise because you want to fit your parts better and you want to not have to have as much bulk here and you might want to taper it or do whatever. And you can see that this nib steps down a little bit from the outside of here and you can kind of mirror that inside of your cap. That's the kind of thing that you'll be able to uh, figure out and progress with down the road. But for now, we're just going to do one drill bit and that's going to be our cap hole and then where we tap the threads. All right, back to what we need here tooling wise. So I always have a drill bit and some fluid around even on the wood lathe all the time. Uh, this is just WD-40 in a squirt bottle and it's an old brush. It's getting a little dirty so it's probably time to replace it. But it's nice to be able to brush off bits or brush off parts without damaging them or getting your fingers on stuff. And usually I've got WD-40 or lubricant on it, so it's nice to not get it all over. And a brush works really well. Just make sure you're being safe. Don't be running the lathe and get a brush caught or anything. But that's a pretty simple one for most of us. So brush and 
WD-40. All right, <clears throat> last thing of, of tooling you may already have is a collet chuck. Uh, any collet chuck that'll fit your lathe is fine. We have a variety of, of ones we use here. We have a couple of the old Beals before they went out of business. We use a couple of the Penn States. Uh, just get the best one you can at, that's available to you and you'll be happy. And you're gonna need a couple of different uh, collets. So you're gonna wanna make sure that if you pick a setup, probably pick it up with the collets if it's available. That way you don't have to hunt down individual collets later. Now I will tell you, we've tried to so stock different collets of the sizes that most of us use because collets can be kind of a pain to find or if you do find them, they might be in like a kit of 20 different collets that you only need three of. So it kind of gets expensive. So that's why we do stock individual collets. But if you can get a set that has them, that's a way to go. One thing you're gonna wanna know about a collet chuck is putting it together. Uh, a lot of people will drop the collet in and then thread the, the lock nut here on it. And that will not work. It will seem to work, but what it is is there's a huge space in here and your collet will not seat properly and it will not wrap around your your material correctly. You need to set the collet in the, the nut here and snap it in. And you'll see it doesn't fall out and it's almost flush at the front. And then thread that in. You'll see even on YouTube, people will use a collet chuck and they'll have trouble with it and they're not sure why and usually that's why. So uh, if you have a collet chuck, you're, you're in good shape because you are gonna want one. This collet chuck is one of those items that if you don't have it, you can probably use a drill chuck for some of the functions, but there may be other functions you want to use a collet chuck for or some other sort of chuck like a, a four jaw chuck or a, a scroll chuck of some sort. And that way you can hold your material because we're gonna use this to mostly hold material and mandrels. So that's gonna be kind of important. All right, set this aside. All right, next thing, probably the last thing of, of tooling is a micrometer. Um, you want a good micrometer. It doesn't have to be expensive, but it needs to be good quality and give you legit readings. Um, if you do want to invest in a good micrometer, you're probably wise to do so because you'll use it a lot. Um, but just something simple that can give you good readings. Most of them have uh, standard and metric, so you're in good shape because it just depends on what uh, the other parts are, the other drill bits are that you're using that you might want to measure as well as your parts. So a good micrometer is definitely a must. All right, now let's move on to stuff we don't necessarily have in the shop already. Um, we're gonna talk, well, let's just go over mandrels real quick because that's a pretty easy one. With custom pen making, you're gonna need a way to hold your body, so, or your parts. When you go to shape this and turn this, and you've got threads here, you can't put it in a chuck, you'll destroy it. So you have to have a way to hold it on the lathe and you're gonna need mandrels. Mandrels are simple. They use the threads that you have inside or outside to go on. That might be a different thread, I don't wanna cross thread it. To go on and then hold it. So this would be on here and now I can spin it on the lathe and sand it, polish it, shape it, whatever. Mandrels can be bought or made. Uh, we carry Beaufort mandrels at Turner's but most of the mandrels you see here in my rack are homemade. Uh, this might be a Beaufort here. Uh, I used to get mandrels from Jim Hines when they're available. So there's a variety of places you can do it, but don't be afraid to make your own mandrels. That's probably one of the biggest things I see when people are starting out is they're real nervous to try to make a mandrel. Don't be, you can turn aluminum and generally brass on your lathe uh, with carbide tools or if you have a friend with a metal lathe, you can have them make them for you or at least get them shaped out and then you can use your tap and dies to make these. Because these threads on the mandrels are gonna mimic the threads on your pen. So if this is an M13 cap, this would be an M13 mandrel that it would go on and thread on. So mandrels are kind of a, an intimidating thing when you're first starting, but after you make a couple or ruin a couple and remake a couple, then you're gonna really get it. This is all different stuff that we use here. We got three different cap mandrels and body mandrels. Um, 
I don't know that I love aluminum, but it's easy to make, so I probably make more things out of aluminum than I should. Brass tends to hold up a little better and not bend as easy as aluminum, so brass is a good choice if you can do it. And people even do a lot of mandrels out of Durlin. So Durlin is, is fairly consistent and it threads well. So if you have Durlin, that might be the easiest way to start on your wood lathe. Durlin is also really inexpensive. Like rods of three quarter inch Durlin are probably like three or four bucks. So you can, you can practice on that and at least try to make them. Here's the thing, if a mandrel gets tweaked at all or bent, you're gonna probably not like it because you're, I'm gonna exaggerate here, but you're, blank is gonna wobble and you'll be trying to sand it or turn it, it's gonna wobble funny. So a lot of times these aluminums work great until I bump them or hit them with something and then they're bent and I throw them away and make a new one. So it's not the best in aluminum and Durlin may be similar, I don't know. I've never made Durlin mandrels, but I know a lot of people do. Any other questions on mandrels, let me know, but that's kind of the, the low down and dirty. Uh, here, I'll show you this. So it's interesting. Um, some people will make their section mandrel to where the mandrel or the section goes over the mandrel and threads onto the threads that the nib uses like this and you can tell that's what i do because it's sized for this even though zach made this it's sized that same size other people will make a reverse like this to where this threads in and those are different size so i don't want to thread it but basically this would thread in and you would have your your section sitting like that with a live center. Either way you do it, you want a live center on the other end to support this, even though it's short and tiny, because any little bit of pressure, once you start making these, you're gonna see these threads are probably a millimeter at the most thick. So any awkward pressure at the wrong time while it's spinning will just snap it right off. So these are the most delicate. That's why everyone hates making sections that I talk to, because they're very delicate. So. That kind of illustrates the points, point of there's more than one way to do it. You can thread them in this way or flip them and use the inside threads. Really, you're gonna develop a, a process and the way you like to do it and that's how it should be. Now I will say, remember we talked about the section using four different drill bits. If you look at my mandrel up close, which you can't right now, but uh, there's a couple little steps and it kind of mimics this nib in how it steps down and steps down. And that way when my section is over it, I don't get wobble this way. And it's nice and tight and any tightness and nowhere for it to go is usually better. If you have places it can move or wobble, you're asking for breakage. So really once you kind of wrap your head around how you make this stuff and what you're trying to accomplish, it kind of becomes easier to you. So mandrels are not complicated, but they are intimidating and not very fun in the beginning. Uh, I don't know if everyone else does, but I still have days where I'll, um, I'll go to make sections and I'll make like 20 in one day and they're all perfect. And then the next day I'll break three in a row and quit and go do something else. So some days it just doesn't flow and some days it does. And I don't know why. All right, so that is mandrels. Uh, you're gonna end up with a lot of mandrels as time goes on because you're gonna do probably different sizes, different lengths. You have to imagine that aside from the inside body, if you're using the same M10 for every body, you're probably in good shape with the body mandrel. But every time you make a new size, let's say you go from M13 to M12, you gotta make a new mandrel because now your threads are different. If you go from M13 to M14, now you gotta make a bigger one. M15, a bigger one. So ultimately, if you're making 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, you'd need multiple sets of mandrels for each size. So stay organized, label everything. That kind of thing. Anybody else determine if that's a caliper or a micrometer? Yeah, so we learned. Okay, what do we got? We got educated in the chat, basically. So calipers, or no, micrometers are like C-shaped or like curved. Micrometers are, micrometers? Yes. Micrometers are C-shaped. I have a bunch of those. I never use them. Yeah. And um, calipers are? And calipers are what you have there. So these are calipers? Yep. Okay, good. And uh, they both work. They both work. Yeah, and if, now you're gonna have to correct me if I say micrometer, if you get a pair of calipers, and I don't know why they're called a pair because there's only one, <laughs> but if you get a pair of calipers, I like digital because all those little lines and dials, whew, it's above my pay grade. So 
you can use the the dial type, but boy, for me, it's a lot harder. So I got digital. All right, moving on. Mandrels, you're gonna have fun with these. All right, let's talk taps and dies. So there's a lot of debate out there on taps and dies. Actually, there's not a lot of debate, there's some debate, but I'm gonna zoom in here. For this pen, I'm gonna move this over here. You're gonna see that we have three taps and two dies. The reason being is we're gonna have a cap inside and outside, a body inside and outside, and a fountain pen nib inside. So we have three taps, two dies. And obviously these are pairs because this goes together and so forth here. And that's where your pairs of taps and dies go. Now, generally speaking, your nib section, you don't really have options. It's a certain size. These are really small, fine threads. This is an M4 by 0.5, which 0.5 is the pitch of the thread. And it is, I mean, if, if I look at this, I can barely see the threads, it's so fine. So that is kind of, it is what it is. The nib companies make these, so we don't really have any say in it. Your inside section and body tap and die, you do have a little bit of leeway there because you can do different sizes. M10 is popular, M9 is less popular, and M11 is less popular. M10 is by far the most chosen. Uh, M10 by one is probably the most popular. There's also an M10 by 0.75, which is a little finer thread. So you have options there. Generally speaking, if I was gonna give you advice, get the M10 by one, because that's what most people use. So if anyone ever wants to help you or you wanna use somebody's tool or mandrel or tap and die, you can generally use it because not a lot of people use the 0.75. Uh, but this is a single start which is all you need for the inside threads because you can put it in and thread it. The cap and body tap and die uh, are generally triple lead or triple start threads. And what that means is when you go to thread a cap onto a body, if it's a single start, you're gonna get some rotation before the two threads find each other and start to wind in. So with a single start, thread, there's only one starting point on the top of this rotation of threads to start threading. With a triple start or a triple lead, you have three, which allows you to almost instantly put it on and start turning where it's threading. Versus if you had to find the first start, you might rotate it, you know, three quarters, half, whatever around before it hits the thread and starts threading. So people generally like triple lead on the threads so they can put their cap on real quick. It's just nicer and smoother. It feels really good. Nothing wrong with single start tap and dies. They are quite a bit cheaper, but your customers or maybe yourself are definitely gonna probably prefer triple lead. So that's where you run into the dilemma of price over you know, what you're getting. Uh, these are generally expensive, so a and I don't know the exact prices, but a M13 triple lead, I think is around $200 for the tap and the die. Now keep in mind, you can use that over and over and over. So once you have it, you have it. An M10 single start tap and die. Uh, I think we have these that are around 50, 60 bucks. And they're good quality, which is why they're a little more. You can probably find cheap ones that are a little less. And then the, uh, the fountain pen nib tap is about, I think, 30, 40 bucks, something like that. Now, I can tell you these, these two, the M10s are not made in the US, they're made in China, but the triple lead and the, the four taps we have for, for nibs are all made in the US by Tapco. And unfortunately, Tapco is, is really good, but they're really expensive and that's just how it works. But we usually stock 11, M11 through M15 in these taps and die sets. So you can usually get those uh, in any size you want for your cap and body. They're really good quality. I've only seen once or twice where there was an issue with 
a crooked cut or a bad cut or something. And Tapco will generally take care of it and we'll help you out with that. So uh, quality wise, Tapco stuff is really good. And that's what most custom makers that are using taps and dies use. So you're gonna have these three taps and dies. This is part of that big upfront cost that I was talking about. But once you have it, you can make pretty much as many as you want with it. So that's kind of a nice thing. Yeah, so Amy said in the chat, everyone's talking about making mandrels on a wood lathe or a metal lathe. It's gonna be, in my opinion, it's gonna be a lot, lot easier on a metal lathe if you have that option. So if you have one or know someone with one, it's probably your best bet because it's gonna be easier to make a nice straight mandrel. It can be done on a wood lathe, but it's definitely gonna be more of a challenge, but it can definitely be done. I would use carbide on brass or aluminum or Durlin. So if I was gonna turn a mandrel on either, uh, well, on a metal lathe, you typically have a little different tooling, but on a wood lathe, I would use carbide for sure. The smallest tap is the nib housing tap. So that's what goes in your section. And there's, there's multiple sizes of this. Like for example, we carry two box sizes and two Yovo sizes, a uh, five and a six in each. So you can get one of four, depending on what you want in your pen. I will mention, it's kind of out of place, but I will mention most people make and prefer the larger nib, the six or larger. The six is the most popular over the five. So the five is nice if you're making a smaller pen or a slimmer pen, but the six is definitely the most popular. And this is a six here. Let's see, I think Jim has a six in this one. Or is there, yeah, black six. Uh, the question is what size tap for a Bach nib? I, offhand, I don't remember because there's so many little numbers in it, but if you look on Turner's, you can see the Bach five and the Bach six, and we have the sizes listed there. And those are all, like I said, Tapco taps, so those are really good quality. But the sizes are listed on each tap and die. If you guys are watching <clears throat> and you're, if you're watching and wondering about any of this stuff we're talking about, on the home page of Turner's Warehouse, we listed all this stuff because it's just easier than trying to direct you to all these different items. So it's we, pinned. oh, it's pinned in the chat. So you can, you can click on that. So it'll kind of show you all this stuff. Now we don't carry my, what are they again? Calipers? calipers. We don't carry calipers. Uh, actually we do have some calipers. We don't have mit mitutoyo, mitutoyo. I can never say it. Uh, but we do have a more of a generic caliper. Yes, caliper. Um, but most of the other stuff we do have, so uh, it's all listed right there. So it makes it easier. All right, so moving on, those are the tap and dies. So if you have any questions, let me know. But those are the three, and I say three sizes, but like I said, there's multiple options for the the body section threads, and there's multiple options for the cap and, cap and body threads. So I'm telling you these sizes that I have in front of me here, but you can, you can move them around and make you know whatever size you want. So since we're talking about um, sections and bodies and things, I'm just gonna leave this out. We're gonna use this again. Let's talk about the tenon cutter. So the tenon cutter, was originally made by Jim Hines. This is his design, Jim Hines. Uh, we actually make this at Turner's uh, for Jim. And so the ones he sells are from, from us and the ones we sell are from us. And uh, this is all his design. And what's cool is this set now comes with all the bushings from nine millimeter to 15. And those are the, the range from what you would need for the body for inside the cap or I'm sorry, inside the section and the body, all the way up to 15. So if you're making a really big pen, cap and body, you've got a 15. And what this does, and we're gonna do uh, a demonstration of just this in a video that we're gonna post here real shortly, is what this does is it allows you to cut the tenon for your threads. So we're talking the outside threads with ease by using this carbide cutter and this will be mounted in your lathe, this will be mounted in the tailstock, and this would go in and it would cut this tenon to an exact size. So you would use a bushing to set your tenon cutter to the right size. So this is a, let's see, 
This is a 10. So if I was going to make one of these, I would, I would cut my blank. This is for setup. I should say that. This is a setup bushing. So I'd set it up with a 10, and then I would feed my blank onto the tenon cutter, and this would cut the exact size I need for these threads. So I cut the tenon, and then I could use my tap, I'm sorry, my die to cut the threads. Sorry, we had an airplane flying over. So the tenon cutter, it does two things that are really important. One is it really speeds up cutting the tenons, because otherwise I'm going to be measuring, cutting a little, measuring, cutting a little, measuring. Uh, so it speeds you up, and two, it makes everything repeatable and fairly easy. So if I'm making a bunch of sections, I can set it up once and go through and cut all my tenons, go through and cut all my tenons on my body, and then go back and do all my tapping. So it makes it nice for, for repeatability and for speed of, of getting ready to cut those threads. So the tenon cutter is one of those things that it's not, I wouldn't call it a must-have, but it's a very nice-to-have item. And especially with all the bushings, you can make virtually any size tenons you need from all these different setup bushings. It does come with the Allen wrench and the size drill bit. It's a six millimeter that you need for the shaft, for the guide shaft. Uh, so that all comes with it. So it's kind of all inclusive. And this is, like I said, made here right in Arizona. We make this and it's really cool. So this is the Jim Hines tenon cutter and it makes it really easy. Uh, the question is, do we sell these bushings separately? Uh, we do not at the moment. However, I'm gonna have a bunch made here uh, so we can offer these. Cause I know a lot of people bought them before we would sell them with just like a set of bushings, like a 10 and a 13 or a 10 and a 14 or whatever. And I know you have the tool, but you need the bushing. So we will get those listed. For those of you that have the tenon tool before we offered it with all the bushings. So it's a little more expensive with all the bushings, but you kind of want it because then you can do anything you, you need with it. So the tenon tool is a nice tool to have. It really helps. If you're only going to make one pen, would I buy it? No. But if you're going to make multiples, I would definitely put it on the list for when you can. So good tool to have for sure. All right. We're still going to be talking taps and dies here. Uh, let's talk about the niche uh, tap and die holding system. So that's this thing right here, which you probably can't see. Well, yeah, you can see it. What this is, because this is kind of a confusing one too. This is another tool. Uh, do I have to have it? No. Will it make my life a lot easier? Yes. And if you're going to make a lot of these, I highly recommend it. If you're making one or two, maybe not. But what this is, is a tailstock mounted in your Morse taper system for holding your taps and dies. Now, if you look on that homepage and see this set, you're gonna see a seven piece set. And what it is, is it comes with the handle I'm holding here with your chosen Morse taper. It comes with two die holders and two tap holders. And then there's extra die holders and tap holders that are larger. So. Uh, generally speaking, like if you look at these taps and dies, the M10 and the M13, this is a one inch die. This is a one and a half inch die. Why that's important is think about if you have your material and then you need to go and thread this on flat and true without crooked or tilting. It's really hard to do. I mean, by hand, it's almost impossible. They sell die holders that you can do by hand, but on something like this, it would almost never be straight or I don't even know what the word is. Centrifugal, I don't know. And if you're trying to put a cap on it that lines up correctly this way, you really need it to be flat and straight. So you need some sort of die holder. And in the past, I used to use back in the day, it's funny because I just found this today. I didn't know I still had it. This is a die holder that would go in my Morse taper. I put my die in here and I would thread it on, but I had to crank my Morse taper, even though this isn't spinning, just to advance it and try to turn the material at the right rate to get it lined up because I couldn't just pull this out because then it's wobbling in the Morse taper and I couldn't do it by hand because it would be crooked. So these are okay, but I don't know for what. So it didn't ever work that great. 
I didn't ever love this thing. When this first, when I first started using these, oddly enough, they were made here in Phoenix. They're still made in the USA, uh, but they were made by a guy named Neil, and he made these for, I think, like model train builders or something like that, maybe. And I talked to him on the phone a bunch. I never got to meet him, and I think he's passed away. But before he passed away, he sold this uh, to a guy named Mark back east, and he makes them still in the US. So we, we still carry these. Um, they're the original Neil's niche design. Now they're called the niche tool set or niche uh, tap and die set. And how this works is, here, let's go over to the lathe. You put this in your, in your tailstock, and then you would put your tap or your die holder, whichever you want to do. And everything has an Allen wrench, which is good because you do want to lock it in. And now, imagine my materials here spinning. I can get this close, right? And then I can slide this with precision and allow it to move without having to try to crank my tailstock while this is spinning or I'm doing it by hand. It just makes it a lot easier. So most of the time I'll spin my lathe by hand and I'll thread this on. And what's cool is when I'm done, I can just let go and this is gonna free spin. So I'm never at risk of this is still moving here and this is at the end and I'm gonna snap my threads off. Because as soon as I let go of this, it's spinning freely. But it's precision so I can slide it back and forth without having it get out of whack as far as the, the X, Y, Z, whatever here. And it just makes it more precise. Now, if you wanna put your <coughs> tap on here, you would change the, the holder. So it holds both the taps and the dies. You put your die holder in. I'm gonna back this up a little bit. Put your tap into the holder. And tighten her down. And it does the same thing, whoops. I guess you gotta actually tighten it down, not just think you tighten it down. So now I can move my tap forward and backward. One thing to note, because we do get questions on this, there is a little bit of play in this which is actually kind of needed because you need it to find center. And if this was rigid and your material was a little bit off, it would tend to drill rather than thread the hole. So this will kind of find the hole here as it is fed in. So this is why this is good because you have that free floating essentially to get in that hole. So slides back and forth. You can give yourself as much room as you need and you have that variability. And there again, I can tap my hole because a lot of times I'll have the lathe running slowly. I can tap, 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 let go and just let it free spin, turn off the lathe, and then back it up by hand if I want to. So it gives you the options of how you want to do your tapping uh, one way or the other here. And what's nice is all the different heads, the different tap sizes, the different die si uh, holders, all fit on the same tool here. So you don't have to change this out you can just change out the head if you're working on multiple things. Makes it really easy. Actually, I'm gonna leave that out. All right, let's go back over here. So if you look at this, you're gonna see the seven piece is two tap holders, two die holders, the handle, and a, uh, I don't know what it's called, leverage bar or something. I don't use the bar a lot, it's the other hole here, but it, it, what it does is it helps, it's a stop really. So it'll stop on your lathe, it'll touch the bed, and then you can thread onto it with it firm. So it probably would be helpful depending on what you're doing, but I just don't need it. All right, so this is one of those tools, nice to have, is it a must have? No, especially in the beginning. Down the road, if you start making a lot of them, I would definitely look into it. If you do pick one up, just look at the different sizes that come with it and determine what you're doing. If you're getting a die that's large, you're gonna need that larger one. If you're doing smaller stuff, and I think this holds up to the M12 if I'm remembering right, maybe even the 13 is smaller. I think only once it jumps to the 14 is the big one. So 
I'm pretty sure, don't quote me on it, you can do up to an M13, which is the most popular size M13, uh, in the stuff that comes with the set. So you don't need this until you jump to 14. So I think we've covered everything uh, as far as the tooling. Now I'm assuming everyone has a lathe and tools for their lathe and that kind of thing. Uh, but this is the specifics for the kitless, sorry, the custom, that's what we're calling it, <laughs> bespoke uh, pens. Like I said, it can be a little daunting and a little confusing. Uh, and if you guys want, we can kind of take pictures or make lists if it helps. But it really, once we start working through this and we drill a body and tap it, you're going to say, oh, that's it. Like, it's pretty easy. It's just the consistency and getting nice flow. Uh, sometimes you'll do everything right and it'll be a little off and you don't know why. And I don't know why. Um, but you can do it on a metal lathe. You can do it on a wood lathe. It doesn't matter. We're going to do everything this month on the wood lathe. If there is enough interest down the road, we could do some metal lathe stuff if people want. So that would be an option. All right. I think that is all that is for today. So I know that was a lot of information and I showed you a lot of tools, but it's going to make a lot more sense as we work through this. I would say if you have time between now and next week, go on a couple custom makers um, websites and look at their pens and just kind of say, okay, that's the, you know, the different threads and where it is. And you can look at designs, uh, something you might want to try. I don't know, but it's good to look at work, other work and see what you want to make. So everybody get ready. Next Wednesday, we are going to make the cap and body. We're going to do this copper pen here or copper blank here. Um, I will tell you the reason custom pen blanks or kitless pen blanks are longer generally is because you're making those three parts. So if you lay them out, you're gonna need a little extra for each one. If you lay them out, you're gonna use about this much and that's why we make them this long. Generally speaking, if it's resin, you can get away with two shorter blanks just fine. Uh, typically people are trying to preserve the pattern through the blank, but most, most resins are hard to do either way. So it doesn't matter. Yes, Amy? So the question is how can you tap without the thing I just showed you? And that is a great question and I should have said that. Who was that? Shout out, Kevin. Good, good question. Uh, basically, you would use a drill chuck. Now, the trick is you're back to that. You kind of have to crank it slowly while you thread the tap uh, or tap the tap. Tip tappy. <laughs> um, so it's kind of a, a challenge there. That's how I've done it before this set, but it's been a long time, so I haven't done that for a while. But you just slowly crank as you're threading it on to keep it moving. Now, one other thing to keep in mind, and we're going to go over this more when we do it, is when you're tapping something, a cap or a body, you want to go in, say, a thread, and then back it up. And what the backing up does generally is cuts the chip loose. So you want to kind of go forward, 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 backward, forward, 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 backward. And it's harder to do with this. It can be done, so don't think it can't be. It can be. It's just a little more uh, coordination on how you're threading and moving your blank. I would not do it with the lathe running. Most tapping and dying we're going to do with the lathe off. Yeah, so most threading will be with the lathe off. It's a lot easier on the metal lathe to do it with the lathe running. So that's where I learned. So that's what I do most of mine on. Um, and it's a lot easier because the metal lathe is a lot slower than the wood lathe, even on the lowest setting. <coughs> and the metal lathe, especially with this thing, because I can, I can literally let it thread in and then stop and let it spin and then back it up, which isn't ideal because you want to do the forward, 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 backward, forward, 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 backward. Um, but it works pretty good. And there are some drill bits that you can get like an M10 that has the drill, the pilot drill and the threads built into it. So it's really fun and easy to just let her, let her rip. Um, I probably wouldn't do it if it was something I was really worried about or I couldn't replace. But if it's just a blank I made, I probably would try it. <laughs> Um, so the, the question or the, what Amy said is people are talking about the section and it is the most difficult. It is definitely the most difficult because you have, like I said, four different drill bits, five if you want to count the tenon cutter if you're using that. Then you have a tap and a die and you're doing all that tapping and dying on something that's so thin that if you 
move your die too far to the shoulder and hit it, it'll crack off. So it's definitely the most difficult, but it is, once you do it a few times, you're kind of like, eh, it's not that bad now. Uh, ebonite is a good choice for this, for the section or for the whole pen if you want. Um, ebonite, we used to have some, I don't know if we have any more here at Turner's Warehouse. Um, there's a guy in Japan that makes great ebonite, but I don't remember his name and it's probably hard to get. But there is a place called Vermont Freehand and he's a really great guy. I forget his name, shoot. But he's a great dude and I have bought ebonite from him for probably 10 years or more. And he sells it in like six inch pieces or longer pieces. Really just be aware of the diameter. And generally you just wanna get some black. Black to me as a section looks good with everything. I had this whole discussion with Zach Higgins when he was here and we were making these. I'm like, I usually make like 20 black sections for when I break other stuff. I could just throw a black section in there because it looks good with any pen. Oh, that one isn't. But this is an ebonite pen. And what ebonite is, is hard rubber. If you smell it, it smells like a rubber band. It really does. Here, smell it. <laughs> if you've ever taken a rubber band and gone like that and smelled it, it, smell like it smells like a rubber band because it's hard, hard rubber. And it's an old material, like the origins of it are way back, but it's a really durable material. It threads nicely and the threads hold up well, which is important for this because the last thing you want to do is make a pen for somebody that really loves it and then the threads just rip off or deteriorate over time. So ebonite is a good choice for sections and we can, maybe we can make one when we do it. I don't know. We'll see what we got. Good discussion, everyone. What else we got? The chat has been on fire, Amy says. So good. Everybody, please subscribe to the channel because we want you to catch these others and we want you to watch other stuff. Uh, share this. If you know other pen makers who are wanting to get into custom pen making, please share this with them so they can watch. September is kitless month. We got a lot of good stuff going. We are going to put out a video series without all this chit chat with y'all um, as well. But this is more fun because you get to ask questions or have discussions on what a caliper is. Um, and whatever else. Amy said, uh, there's a lot of awesome makers in the chat answering questions, so thanks for doing that because it is hard to moderate a bunch of chat and have all the answers if you're just one person. And although Amy's made pens, she hasn't made any customs yet. So I guess that's our next step, Amy. Yeah, you need to make customs. Uh, the question is, can tapping be done using wood, stabilized blanks, and CA glue? Uh, can it be done? Probably. Will it last? Probably not. Threads are so, like, imagine what threads are. They're just little triangles of the material, right? And I would imagine even stabilized wood, it's just going to eventually crack and deteriorate. So I wouldn't do that. Now, you can make a, a pen like this out of wood, but what you'd want to do is sleeve the inside with some ebonite or some resin of some sort, uh, but that's a whole nether video. <laughs> But there's some great people who do that out there if you look around. Oh, here's one. So this is a wood pen. Um, it's like a little walnut or I don't know what the wood is. But it's got a, it's not ebonite, it's metal. It's got a metal section and you can see there's metal threads and it's got like ebonite sleeves in it. Oh, this thing's got ink in it. Glad I didn't pull that off. Oh. And there is a number five or even smaller. I think that's smaller. There's a good example of different sizes. Can you make the pen? Can we put a cap on it? Multiple people are like, or not a cap, a clip. A clip? Yeah. <clears throat> so the question is, is it when we make the pen in this series? The question is, can we make the pen cap and put a clip on it? Uh, we could, but we're not gonna. So this is gonna be, we'll do it right after though. We'll do it like the next week. Uh, because I don't, wanna, I don't wanna veer off from what we're trying to accomplish here, which is teach the basics to the beginners who wanna get started. And then literally the next week we'll do a cap with a clip because it's a lot of fun. And I think it looks cool. Here. You can do roll stops or clips or whatever. Um, and it looks good. And I think it looks more like a pen. I like pens without clips because I can put them in my side pocket, but anything I put up here, I want to clip on. So uh, we will do that the next week, but not these first couple weeks. Fair enough? Yeah. 
Cool. Thanks, everybody. Uh, be sure and come next week when we actually make some stuff. It's going to be really fun. Uh, you know, it's live, so I'll probably break a couple things and blow them up. Usually that's how it goes. But we'll, we'll get some stuff made. We'll answer some more questions. It's going to be much more focused and specific the next couple weeks because we're actually going to be doing a task. And with that, I'm going to show you some of the variations you can make when you go to do yours. If you want to make yours a little more fine detailed or exquisite quality, uh, and we'll go from there. But it's going to be a lot of fun, so check it out. If you have any questions in the meantime, let me know. Uh, either on YouTube here, you can comment or email Amy at Turner's Warehouse. Notice I gave you hers, not mine. And uh, I'll answer questions with her, and we'll get back to you ASAP. Thanks for watching, everybody. Please like and subscribe, and we will see you next week. All right, we're good. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week and weekend. Awkward silence. <laughs>